All right, guys, I think um, I'm actually, we're not going to get into Ampere's Law yet in this video. Uh, I think there's just a couple related applications to what we discussed last time that I want to go over. Uh, the first thing I want to mention that I, I meant to talk about last time but didn't, which is, is how do we determine the direction of the magnetic field near a current carrying wire? Um, and uh, there's another right-hand rule. This is sometimes called the curled finger right-hand rule. Some of you might be familiar with this, but uh, <clears throat> let's imagine that you had a wire, um, and maybe we could say like the wire is here, and that wire here is carrying a current, and maybe just for the sake of argument, we'll imagine, we'll zoom in here a little bit, we'll imagine that the direction of the current is this way. I'll say I is that way. The, the, the question is, what's the, what's the direction of B? And to do that, we're going to do another right-hand rule. And I'll try to demonstrate it here. Um, maybe if I just use the pen as my example. If this, is the current, if this is the wire carrying the current, and let's say that the current is going that way, what I do is I take my right hand and I point my thumb in the direction of the current, and then I imagine grasping, sorry, thumb in the direction of the current, and I imagine grasping the wire with my thumb pointed in that direction. And as you can see, I can't grasp the, the pen or the wire by reaching with my fingers in above. I have to put my fingers in beneath the wire and curl them around like so. And the direction that my fingers curl in that case will be the direction of the magnetic field. So to go to this example here, if I imagine with my right hand trying to grasp that wire, I'll zoom out so you can see this a little bit more easily. If I imagine trying to grasp this wire, I have to reach in with my fingers beneath the wire, curl my fingers behind the wire, and then my fingers would be coming out on the top of the wire. What that means is, that is to say that the direction then of the magnetic field below the wire is going to be into, so it's going to be into the page, and the way we draw into the page is X, so this is the direction of the magnetic field here. And on the top of the wire, the direction of the magnetic field would be out. And again, you can use the right hand rule to sort of convince yourself of that. So that would be the direction of the magnetic field B. Similarly, if the wire, maybe just to really quickly think about another situation, if the wire were like this, with the current going in this direction now, if the current were maybe, I don't know, upward like so, once again, if I point my thumb up and I imagine grasping that wire, I have to curl my fingers behind the wire like so and out. So the direction of the magnetic field on this side would be in and on, on this side would be out. So this is in and this is out. Okay. I, uh, so that's a, a, just a, a new right-hand rule that, that you should be familiar with for determining the direction of... Um, magnetic field around current carrying wires. So now what I want to think about, maybe we'll go full screen here. Zoom out a little bit. So we have a little more space to work. Um, I want to imagine rather than just having one current carrying wire, what would happen if we had two current carrying wires? So here I have two wires as indicated. Um, this is wire A here, and this is wire B here. And wire A carries current I sub A, wire B carries current I sub B. They'll have a length L, and the distance between them, the horizontal distance here, is D. So now I want to think about what would happen. Each of these wires has, or will create a magnetic field, and um, since there's current through the wires, the the charges moving through the wires will respond to the magnetic field created by the other wire. So what's going to happen? Well, first of all, maybe let's think about the magnetic field that will be created by A. If we use that right-hand rule, thumb pointed up, grasping the wire, we can see that the direction of the field from A is going to be into the page here. This is going to be, I'll call that B sub A. So that's the direction of the magnetic field due to wire A. Of course, over here, B sub A would be like so. All right. So if, B, if, if the magnetic field due to B is down, as we see here, then um, that means that there's the, the charges that are moving 
upward through this wire are going to experience a force. The wire is going to experience a force. And we know what that force is. We know that the force that B experiences due to A is going to be equal to ILB. Um, 90 degree angle. So I mean, I, I could say ILB sine theta if I want, but I know sine theta is just going to be one. So it's just going to, it's just going to be I times L times B. Where this I, this is I sub B. And this B, this is B, what we're calling BA. This magnetic field is the magnetic field due to the current in, in A. So now, um, if I wanted to write this, I could also write this. So again, this is B due to A. I could substitute in our expression that we determined last time for B. We know that B, based on our discussion last time, is mu naught times I over 2 pi times this distance D. And this I would be IA. So that is BA right there. That's the B due to A. So if I make that substitution, I end up with IB times L times mu naught times IA over 2 pi D. So that would then be an expression for the force of B on A. By, without even doing it out, you. you we can we, we know from Newton's third law that if that's the force that um, that B experiences due to A, then there has to be the same force from A back on B. In other words, the forces here have to be attractive. So these forces have to be equal by Newton's third law, and they have to both have exactly this magnitude right here. Um, so this would be, we call this, this is FB from A, and this would be FA from B, and they're going to have the exact same value, and you can redo out this expression, and you will indeed get the same exact value. This is the force on current carrying wires. You can convince yourself now that if, if we redid this, if they had opposite direction currents, in other words, so I, I was doing this, and maybe, I guess I wasn't clear on this, um, I was imagining both of their currents being upward. I guess I should have noted that. I was envisioning both of the currents were being upward there. Um, that might have been confusing for you. But if one of these were now downward, in other words, if the currents were not in the same direction, if they were in opposite directions, you can redo it and convince yourself, or, or maybe it's just worth doing right now. Um, let's imagine B, instead of being up, what would happen if the direction of the current in, in wire B was down, if IB was downward? Um, well, you can see all of this would remain the same except the force here, the direction of the force by the cross, cross product ILB would be to the right. And so what you would have then is a case where the two wires rather than, a, the two wires rather than attracting each other would be repelling each other. Um, and again, that's, that's coming from the right hand rule. Um, that's the IL cross B, the direction of the, the force is I times L cross B, that right-hand rule that we were doing before. Um, I hope that's clear. If, if, if the directionality is confusing to you, it might be worth revisiting um, this expression here from, uh, from chapter 28. Okay. Uh, I want to briefly mention another application of this principle, which is the so-called rail gun. This is a, um, this is a way of, of, uh, creating a sort of a projectile launcher. Let's imagine I've got two metal rails here. And in between the metal rails, I have what's called a fuse. And this is usually a very, very, very thin, very, very thin piece of conducting metal, something, something like copper. And then what you do is you run a, um, a very large current, I, call that I, you run a very large current up through this rail. That current goes up this metal rail, goes through this very thin piece of uh, metal called, again, this thing is called here, this is called the fuse. And then the current comes down like so, I. So in other words, there's some sort of voltage source um, between these two points, say, right? You could have a, some sort of a, a battery here, say. They were hooking up right there, right there, and right there. And so the current moves like so. And um, what happens is if this current is very, very large, in other words, if this, if this battery is very, very strong, you're going to generate an enormous amount of heat in through here. And that heat from the large current will cause this fuse to vaporize. 
And what you can do then is you can put under this circumstance, if we put some sort of a projectile here, we could imagine maybe some kind of like a little like a bullet or something. Here, this is some projectile. Then what happens is when this vaporizes, when, it, when this fuse turns into a gas, then what you're going to have is a situation where if we think about the forces here, there's a magnetic field now due to these two, the current in these two wires. In the direction of that magnetic field, you should be able to convince yourself B is going to be directed inward like so. And since we have a current moving here, you can ask yourself what is going to be the force on this gasified conductor? And you should be able to, again, by using this expression up here, we should be able to convince ourselves that the, the direction of the force is going to be upward. That's from L cross B. Um, and so the force is upward, and so this now, this vaporized, this gasified metal fuse is going to exert a force, going to push this projectile out. And under the right circumstances, you can actually create um, something that, would, that can launch projectiles very, very fast. This is known as the rail gun. Several years ago, I had a student in class who actually built a rail gun, which was kind of fun. Um, that's all for today. Short video, or I don't know if that was short, but um, not a lot of heavy lifting compared to last time. Our next video, I promise, will be about the, um, the law of Ampere, Ampere's law. So that's coming up next.